Martin, here we are, and here we really are approaching Lent 3 this week. John 2 and Jesus, uh, the, what it's called, is called the cleansing of the temple. But can you lead us into this? Can I lead you into it? <laughs> Not the temple, but understanding what's going on here. So, I mean, first of all, the cleansing of the temple appears in all four Gospels. but mm -hmm. uh, And very few events occur in all four of Gospels. So this is, this is a big deal. Yeah, very few events occur in all four. Uh, but... But the interesting thing is, of course, in John's gospel, it's in a completely different place from where it is in the synoptics. Yep. The, so in Matthew, Mark and Luke, um, Jesus basically only goes to Jerusalem once. And that's when he enters Jerusalem uh, on what we call Palm Sunday and uh, begins the, 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 the journey to the cross. And the cleansing of this temple uh, happens right after he has entered Jerusalem on that uh, that one occasion. Of course, in Luke's gospel, he, we've got record of him going when he was 12. But uh, in his adult ministry, uh, it's the synoptic gospels record that one time. In John's gospel, Jesus goes to Jerusalem a number of times. In fact, when you look at it, not a great deal happens in Galilee. Um, and uh, so the interesting question is, why is this uh, account very early on in John's gospel when it is uh, at the, towards the end of Jesus's ministry in the synoptics? And actually, the cleansing of the temple becomes a trigger for the religious leaders plotting to have him killed. And just to say, one of the reasons that um, people say there was three years to Jesus' ministry is because Jesus goes um, to Passover three times in John's Gospel, of course, as you say, in Jerusalem. And this is the first one. First one. Yeah. yeah. So, Carry on. th thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, the, 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 the interesting question is, is, is John's... Uh, location the original one or the synoptics the original when did it happen you can't argue it happened twice um the jewish the religious authorities would never have you know let him get away with the second go um so so what what might be the reason for what one order or the other now it makes absolute sense for it to be um at the end of jesus ministry it's a major event that will cause huge antagonism with the religious leadership and leading therefore to uh, his arrest. Uh, why does John put it uh, right at the beginning? There are some who argue that actually this is the, the maybe the time that it did actually happen, that it was right at the beginning, but you get the sense that the weight the weight of argument really makes, it makes more sense for it to be towards the end. I mean, for example, if, G, if, if Jesus had done it actually on this first visit, they wouldn't have led him near the temple after that. So, so you've got, it, it seems to be the synoptics have it in the right, in the place where it actually happened. The interesting thing for John, of course, is that it, it is really at the beginning. It's the wedding of Cana, and then it's the cleansing of the temple. He goes from Cana, a couple of days in Capernaum, and then to Jerusalem. Mm. And so, so I was, I was just thinking, what, what's, what's going on here? There is still, there's a bit of a sense that, yes, this is, will contribute to his arrest, um, but actually, in John's Gospel, it's the raising of Lazarus that is the trigger point for that. Uh, so what's he doing? And there's something about the, 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 the depth of the challenge that he is setting out on, uh, the depth of the, uh, the transformation that needs to be, needs to happen, uh, in order for the world to become the world that God has called it to be. 
Uh, there's something for me too about the fact that uh, you know the wedding at Cana is all about a foretaste of the of the kingdom. Here is the temple that ought to be representing a foretaste of the, the kingdom, and yet it's got cluttered up with all of this uh, accretion of activity that is uh, against the kingdom. So this is a sign of what needs to be moved out the way, got rid of, in order that Jesus can um, uh, proclaim the gospel. So, so I, you can see how John is using this as a kind of an, another sign that will uh, set his set the framework for his uh, Jesus's ministry. And I suppose then I was thinking for well for for we've, here we are. This is Lent. This is the third Sunday of Lent. So what's it saying to us? It's so for me. I was hearing this as a what if you you know what. Let, let's be really blunt about this. What have you got to get out of the way that is getting in the way of your participation in the kingdom? Um, what, what have you got to clear out? And let's not be mealy mouthed about it. Let's, you know, let's just name it and get rid of it. Mm. So uh, that, that was where I was getting to, but it was triggered by the question of why why this story here and not where the other three gospels have it yeah yeah so um i was i was thinking i think along similar tram lines really um it's do you remember that film mary magdalene came out a couple of years ago was it it wasn't a particularly good film longer ago than that was it was it three or four years ago um but there was one scene in it that was really intriguing and it was the scene of uh, Jesus cleansing of the temple because um what it showed is is perhaps quite realistically that you know um the, the temple would have been in size about if you put it kind of end to end 12 football pitches it was absolutely massive mm. yeah so you know, for Jesus to be turning over a couple of tables in a corner of the temple it might have caused a bit of a disturbance to a few people, but actually, symbolically, it was an act rather than something that necessarily actually prevented the temple from carrying on. And that's exactly what that film Mary Magdalene depicts, that actually there was a little bit of a kerfuffle in one area of the temple, but nobody else noticed. But there's something symbolic here, which, you know, and a number of people around were thinking, yeah, about time too, about time too. Um, and one of the things that it talks about in this uh, passage is Jesus getting angry. Mm -hmm. And the, um, the passage is often used as a justification for people getting angry. Well, you know, just as Jesus was angry, you know, so we should show. That's upside down. <laughs> yeah. Um, and and you, you put that next to something like, say, Matthew 5, 22, where Jesus says, you've heard it said that thou shalt not murder. But I tell you do not be angry with your brother or sister and you know and i remember my, when i was young and if i had an argument with my brother my my mother who who knew a few texts of scripture would say he that calleth his brother a fool is in danger of eternal damnation which i i always thought was perennially hard really as a response to my argument with my brother but you kind of think okay so in the beatitudes jesus is warning us against getting angry and here he is angry himself. So is he hypocritical? I mean, what's going on? Um, and, and what is he angry at? Uh, and I think what you're saying is right. He's not actually angry um, at there being a temple, which he refers to as his father's house. And, and he's not actually angry um, with um, the fact of those people who are enabling people to change their coinage in order that, that there's not idolatrous images of Caesar there near the temple or that, you know, people are, are, are having to buy, um, you know, these doves and things because it doesn't actually say that the money changers and their money changers, not money lenders, are actually exploitative, you know. Um, but, it, but he is angry about the fact that here in the outer Gentile courts of the temple, people are being uh, distracted from and blocked from relationship with God. And zeal for that is what is consuming him. 
that anything that is coming between relationship with God is deeply problematic and the temple is set aside precisely for that kind of focus. So he gets angry about it, which, which rather challenges us about what we get angry about, really, and what zeal consumes us. So I do think this can easily marry up with uh, what he's saying in the Beatitudes, in that so much of our anger is actually about um, th stuff that um, is damaging our brothers and sisters, mm -hmm. rather than that which actually enables us to be putting good and proper relationship with our brothers and sisters and with God. I mean, I have to say, really, I'm with the Orthodox on this, that, you know, one should really avoid um, as much as one can being angry. Uh, because it's not that anger is a sin, but that it's a bit like, you know, I don't know, domestically, you could say a bit like having a heavy cold. Having a heavy cold doesn't normally put you in a good frame of mind to make good, good decisions. And in the same way, anger is, you know, and I know the psalmist gets angry. Well, you know, I'm not saying deny your anger or, you know, refuse to acknowledge it, but it's probably not a good idea to cultivate it. Whereas I think you could say Jesus could handle his anger. <laughs> well, and there's also the difference between the anger, which is your your self-justifying anger and and anger on behalf of others. So Jesus here is anger on behalf of others. Hmm. Um, and uh, and we rightly uh, are angry about, you know, various things about hmm. the state of the world or the state of our society and so forth. And we we will rail and act against that. But that's very different from uh, being angry because uh, you're upset about something that somebody has done to you. Mm. Yeah, no, absolutely. And this, it's the self, it's the self defensive and self justifying anger. That's the destructive bit here. Whereas the, uh, the move, what Jesus is sponsoring here and his anger and his zeal, is that moving outwards in relationship towards God and out of that molding a completely different way of being in our relationship with one another. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. We look forward to the fourth Sunday. Indeed. Indeed.